Welcome to my podcast, Today's Dream, Tomorrow's Reality. My name is Vicki Pohl. I'm a master transformational coach and hypnotist specializing in habit change. And this podcast is sponsored by The Enlightened Peach, and it's all about embracing our mosaic life. And some of you may ask, what is a mosaic life anyway? Well, it is recognizing that all the pieces of our life, the good, the bad, the indifferent, have all come together to make us who we are. Change any one thing and we are different. With that in mind, I invite you to embrace your perceived imperfections and celebrate who you are. This podcast is unedited and raw, just like live. And I am your host and I have a special guest today I'll introduce in just a moment. But before I do that, I would love to ask you to leave a comment on this episode and do me a solid and remember to like, subscribe and share because I want to have a bigger audience for all of my amazing guests and that happens through you. So make sure you remember, like, subscribe and share. All right. So now let's get started. So this lovely lady, I'm going to go ahead and bring her out is Laura Carney. And um, we know each other because I've been involved in a group that a lot of you have heard me talk about before with Stacey Lauren, the Do The Thing. And she had a Do The Thing bucket list challenge and it was all because of Laura's beautiful book. And so I would love to have you just introduce yourself, Laura, tell just a little bit about you, not the whole thing, just a little bit. And then that way we can kind of dive into some different questions and everything. And what's your cat's name, by the way? (laughs) My cat, Pinky, she's taken to being extra noisy if I'm on an interview. (laughs) Hey, I used to have a dog that would snore so loud that everybody could hear him. So that's all right. You go right ahead. <laughs> um, hopefully she, she'll uh, be a little tame during during this interview. Um, but uh, this is my book, uh, My Father's List. Um, and it's about how I spent six years of my life from the ages of 38 to 44 finishing the bucket list of my late father, which we discovered. My brother actually found it. Uh, just in some of his things when he moved into his first house and he and his fiance framed it and gave it to me as the wedding gift as the he called me his best lady at at his wedding (laughs) and of course he was the man of honor at mine and uh, you know as soon as I saw it I knew this wasn't just a family heirloom you know which we didn't even know about we didn't know my dad had anything resembling a bucket list And I actually viewed my father as a person who was very creative, a huge dreamer, and often found it difficult to follow through with a lot of his dreams or to feel like he had succeeded and then would just sort of move on to the next. So to find that he was this organized and he actually (laughs) wrote down, you know, 60 intentions at the age of 29, we found out he wrote it just around the time I was born. Okay. It was like just uh, such a surprise in that way. But at the same time, it was just this lovely reminder of who he was because some of the items were just poetic and funny, you know, like swim the width of a river, you know, the way he said it, or ride oh, a horse fast. Poetic language. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Grow a watermelon. Yes. I mean, he had, you know, uh, during my journey finishing the bucket list, we went to London at one point. And then we also went to Ireland. And even though that was not on the list, my dad was very Irish. And I learned about the storytelling tradition in Ireland. They call themselves, I believe it's pronounced Shana Chi. And it's just, they're so, they were very poetic in the way that they would tell these sometimes tall tales, but mostly the mythology and history of Ireland. And I thought, oh, that's where he gets it from. (laughs) Because he was the kind of person who, when he would tell a story and when he spoke, you knew he was just a lover of words. And he was trying to perfect the way he was saying them and just very poetic. And he was a singer as well. And he was an entertainer and a comedian. Um, And, you know, I think in many ways, some of his greatest legacies were my brother and me having those same talents and trying to develop them in our own lives. And he certainly tried to help us see them when he was alive. And, you know, I had struggled with his death. I think because I think mostly in my case, uh, because it happened when I was 25, um, it happened in a way that made me feel somewhat victimized by something silly and every day, like someone using a phone. 
And uh, it was yeah, because so of a team. And, go ahead and, and tell a little bit. I can hear me echoing for some reason. Oh, can I'll turn the volume it? down. Okay. <laughs> it was, um, but um, I want you to just kind of take a, a step back for a second. Sure. And let's, let's talk about, you know, were you close to your father? Oh yeah, I was you very are? close with him, um, but I didn't see him as much as I wanted to because yeah. my parents divorced. You had a step, when I was they were divorced, and you had a stepdad, right? I do, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, you know, regardless, I think my father made a special effort to just get as much quality time with us as he could. So we did always feel just very, you know, when when we were there with him, we were his world. Um, but Wonderful. but also he had a double life. Um, he was a closeted crossdresser, so okay. he was sort of living another world that we didn't know about. And I and I didn't know about that at all until I was eighteen, and my brother didn't know until a little bit later. But I think that was actually part of the reason why we were sort of um, what's the word for it? Not compartmentalized, but segmented. You mm -hmm. know, like we really were to separate the lives. Yeah, I mean, we really yeah. were his whole world. I have no doubt about that. Like we were his North Star, we were his constant. But at the same time, he was living in a time where his gender identity wasn't very well accepted. And I don't even, I don't know how he felt about it because I never got to have that conversation with him. And, you know, for me personally, as I began writing the book about all of my experiences doing his bucket list, I started understanding there was something deeper going on inside of me that needed, I felt I needed to express, which mm -hmm. was that I realized that as a young woman dealing with my own diagnosis of clinical depression and feeling somewhat stigmatized about that, I was developing almost like a kindred spirit bond with my dad who simultaneously had this double life that he had never told anybody about. I mean. Maybe he told someone along the way besides my mom, but I think his girlfriend might have known. You know, I don't, I don't really know. But we were both struggling like side by side and not able to discuss it and not able to talk yeah. about it. And I think exploring that part of him, you know, I joined a support group for it. Um, I began to understand better what it's like when a straight man has that, and um, you know, understanding it better. And, and forgiving certain things, you know, with, with some of the, the decisions he had to make, it helped me to do that with my own uh, stigma about myself. And like, I really do feel beyond getting to have this incredible legacy now of, you know, I get to inspire other people to live intentionally through my example, or to find a positive way to work through grief because of what I did. But I also get to talk about self-acceptance. And yeah. I think that that's what my father would be the most proud of. I think so. And, you know, because that that is a really big struggle for a lot of people. And they spend their lives living a totally different thing than what they would want. Now, your father was a crossdresser, but he was not gay, right? Or Right, yeah. Right. So I just can't even imagine there are people, you know, that are gay and have to pretend that they're straight. And so that's another level on top of that. And so it's it's a big deal. And, you know, it it is really enlightening to see that your father had the wherewithal to make this list. And even if he did, did he do any of those things that you know of or were they all bucket list things that he never did? He did five of them. Five of them. OK. Yeah. So he had it his whole life. I yeah. found out only recently he had it in his wallet when he died. Oh my gosh. Which just gives me chills because it's like yeah. that probably means that every time, every Wednesday and Sunday when I was with him, he had it on him. Like yeah. I was around this list my whole life. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> didn't even know. That kind of gives you tingles, doesn't it? Yeah. Because they always say things like that about when someone passes away, if you have one of their personal possessions, it's almost like you're you're having a connection with their spirit. And I, it's hard. You'd be hard pressed, I guess, to find something more personal than that. Yeah, because how old did you say he was when he wrote it? Uh, 29. 29, yeah. When I was born, yeah. Yeah. And then and he died wonder, when I was 25. Yeah, you wonder what's going on in his mind when he, when you're being born and all of a sudden he says, oh my gosh, I've been wanting to do these things. I'm going to go ahead and make my list, you know? Did you, did you go to that place? Because I know that would be my first thoughts, right? 
<laughs> yeah, I think um, uh, probably just, uh, I imagine he was in just an extremely enthusiastic moment, <laughs> when yeah, he came, yeah. which he was, known, he was known for. What'd you say? <laughs> Everything's possible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and he yeah. he had a tendency to kind of swing between those and sometimes he would be a little bit more reserved and and I think he probably had depression as well um and related to that in me even though we didn't really talk about it very much. Uh but yeah, he probably was uh you know, even beyond his emotional state and and whatever, you know, he wrote a poem when I was born. He used to write poetry for my brother and me all the time and my mom. Um you know, even beyond that, though, I think, you know, he was extremely well read mm -hmm. and he read uh, a lot about, um, well, I think law of attraction types of things like okay. Neville Goddard, uh, Napoleon oh, Hill. Goddard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like just the, the whole idea. One of my favorites these days is Florence Scovel Shin. Oh, yeah. Um, Mir uh, miracles library. will follow. <laughs> yeah. What did you say? I have her whole library. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Isn't she great? Oh, amazing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even discover that he read those things. All I knew that he liked was Dale Carnegie, you know, how to yeah. influence people because <laughs> yeah. he was a salesman. So he yeah. would have been studying how to talk to other people. And he, I mean, he could have persuaded anybody of anything. That's how he was. Um, but to learn after his death, based on his notebooks, that he also was a fan of Napoleon Hill and these kinds of people, it was like, oh, I'm getting this whole new philosophy now that I didn't even know about. Um, you know, he was very invested in uh, the, your energy and how your energy affects uh, your life. But, you know, I, th I think for him, it was just like, he just got bored really easily. <laughs> so he was always moving from one thing to the next. I mean, so that's why this bucket list, it, you know, it, it has a variety of things on it. Yeah. Well, it's probably because he's such a creative person. Creative people seem to have that, you know, shiny object syndrome, you know, a squirrel, <laughs> you know, it, and because I, I know I do the same thing. I really have to reel myself in a lot of times because I will get like, I'll have to share. I've got a book here that I'm reading and I had started reading it before a long time ago and somebody mentioned it on a, um, on a live that I was at and I thought, well, I'm going to find that book. And I had two of them. So obviously it had happened more than once. And both of them had like a bookmark in there where I'd stopped reading that one. And then I had read on the other one. I guess oh, I bought the second one. My you know? And so, <laughs> <laughs> so I can get that, you know, just starting things and not stopping. So right now I'm almost finished with this book. And I said, okay, this time I'm finishing it and I'm going to donate the extra one to Goodwill. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he used, I remember he said to me once, this might have even been my 25th birthday. He said, Laura, you're just like me. You just love novelty. And, you know, at that time I had just been like diagnosed with ADHD and, you know, I'm thinking, oh, this is a problem. <laughs> like, yeah. like what he's saying is I'm a person who can't commit. And, and like him, I'm just going to chase after dreams and not finish them. Of course, now I don't see it that way at all, because that was one of the gifts that doing his bucket list gave me. Mm -hmm. You know, only a person who loves novelty could have done this. Yes, yes. Because well, <laughs> it's 54 quite, versions of novelty. <laughs> I'm quite impressed that you did the, the list because some of them were not the easiest thing. Because, you know, I was um, I was going back over your book a little bit and um I was reading about your skydiving adventure just right before you got on here. And that one, it's like, oh, you know, it's a great thing, but I don't know that I could do it. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about it was I had, I think it, part of it was because of my activism. So for a couple of years, I was giving speeches in schools and I was, I was teaching what I had learned. And, um, you know, the things that I learned about distracted driving, I thought were really interesting because it, it, they just weren't being spread in the media. Um, yeah. Just that, that even making a phone call, you know, e because in my dad's case, it wasn't a texting driver. It was someone who was making a phone call. So like even doing that is too much for you to actually mm -hmm. be fully there. And and yeah, okay, maybe you'll have a drive back to your house and nothing will be on the road and nothing will happen. It's You could assume that, but at the same time, you just don't know. And, yeah. and I think that it's true that most car crashes happen like within a five mile radius of the person's house because mm -hmm. it is situations like that. So that's what I was learning about and I was kind of pushing myself out of my comfort zone when I would go and speak about this because I hadn't really spoken about 
the way my father died in about 10 years when I did that. And, and you know, I just was kind of just t dipping my toes in the water with trying to take something that had been tragic and making it meaningful and making it something that could help other people. So I think that by the time the list showed up and by then I had already, you know, I'd published an essay in the Washington Post. I published something in Runner's World. Like the weirdest thing would happen every time I pitched a story that involved my dad and involved this issue, people would say yes. And it was like big publications and that had never happened to me before. Yeah. So even though I worked for one, I worked for Good Housekeeping as a copy editor, not as a writer. So as I got to the point where I was ready to jump out of a plane, all I thought was, well, this is my activism. You know, like I can say, hey, look at this scary thing I did. By the way, this was actually safer than if you were driving home tonight and you made a choice where you didn't think you really had to be there. And to me, I saw the dichotomy of that because if you're gonna skydive, you're probably gonna be hyper vigilant. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah. like I saw a, a piece of a parachute hanging out of my tandem jumpers pack and I'm like, is that okay? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I'm trying to keep myself as safe as possible so I don't die doing this. When in reality, and I just laughed when I read this later, in reality, my the, the statistics are so low of somebody dying from doing that as opposed to the high number of people who die from car crashes. So. Um, I felt like I was doing it for something so much bigger than me in that way. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the way the list worked was no matter how scary I thought something was or how impossible I thought it was, I had committed to doing it no matter how many years it took, you know, no matter how much money it took. And, you know, luckily at some point, one thing that started happening was I began to realize that my experiences were turning into a story. And usually whatever I gained from the list item, whatever the lesson was, once I mm -hmm. figured out what the lesson was, I realized, oh, okay, that's why this one had to happen. And I could start as a writer piecing it together. Oh, this is this part of the story. And sometimes there were things like own a large house in our own land, which I thought, I don't know how we're gonna do that. Yeah. And we did it poetically during the pandemic where we couldn't travel anymore. So we went and we, uh, my husband bought a tent and it was an extra large tent. And I, I was reading Walden at the time and, and Walden Thoreau said the only large house he'd ever owned was a tent. You know, so like those things happened simultaneously. And I realized, oh my God, this is my large house. <laughs> like I looked it up <laughs> in the dictionary and technically it's just a house is a shelter, yeah. you know? So it was true and it didn't have to be my literal definition of what it was and and mainly it was about the feeling like am i getting am i getting the feeling of home from being in this large tent with my husband during a pandemic when i think there's bears outside and he's protecting me am i getting the feeling my dad would have wanted to have by having that large house and i thought yes i was so i was getting the lesson regardless of how literal it was yeah so i wanted to ask you um about the um the distracted driver Sure. Don't mind. And because I, I don't remember a lot of stuff about your book. That's why I was trying to peruse it just a little bit before we got on here. Um, but I know that was wasn't the distractive driver was like 16 or 17 or something. 17. Right? Yeah. 17. OK. And so they were talking on the phone or they were making a phone call. Uh, they made they they were lost. They pulled off the highway. They made a phone like a, on a ramp. They made a phone call at a red light and then drove through the next red light. Ah, okay. And That's the next red light your, was the one yeah. my dad was turning yeah. off. At. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that was coming to mind um, for me is, you know, I'm a, I'm a hypnotist. And one of the things that I talk to people about is how we go through our life a lot of times on such an autopilot mm -hmm. that, you know, we uh, driving is one of the major ones where you drive the same path every day. And sometimes you get where you're going and you don't even remember the trip. And um, so one of the things that I'll tell people is to take a different route or do something to keep themselves more alert into the space of this is what I'm doing. So sometimes that may mean it's cold outside and you put the window down a little bit, you know, or you change the kind of music that you're listening to or any kind of thing. So when you were talking to people about the distractions, distracted driving, did you give them like things to do or were you just trying to make them aware? 
Um, at the both? time, what? What'd you say? I said, or did you do both? I don't know. Well, the idea I was presented with, with the way I was trained, was that we really just needed to tell the story about okay. what happened in our particular case. And I always sort of felt like I want to tell more than the moment of my dad's death. Right. Because I think if you hear enough of those stories, it, it can start to feel like you can even start to tune out from that. Yeah. Right. You know, and that doesn't have anything to do with how difficult that person's loss was and how tragic the death was. Because a lot of times it is kids. Um, so it's, it has nothing to do with how well the story is told, you know, or who's telling it. It's just that you've heard it enough times. Um, and I wanted to tell something different. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to tell something that would appeal to people for other reasons. Right. And maybe that part of it would sort of just slip in. So I think that that's why when I started writing the book, it felt more like the right thing for me to do as opposed mm -hmm. to what I had been doing. But, you know, it's interesting what you bring up about uh, helping people to not be on autopilot, because I think that that's probably true when it's people, you know, I have a friend, uh, my mentor, Joel, teaches kids to uh, talk to their parents about it and to say, hey, mom, dad, like, I'm not okay with this when you do this, mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. I think, and he has learned is very effective. And his daughter died, she was only 21 because of a, you know, distracted uh, truck driver. Okay. So I think that's very helpful, but I think in the situation, you know, I guess I'll never know, but mm -hmm. in the situation with my dad, the way I perceived it was that this girl was panicking you know, was probably, I assume she was late. I don't know if she was, that's just me. And yeah. especially when I was 17, <laughs> I was always running late. Yeah. So I, I would imagine if you're in an emotional state where, you know, and she had two siblings in the car with her. So if you're trying to get your siblings somewhere, and I think she was the oldest too. So it's like, you're the responsible one and you've just learned to drive. And you also now have your own cell phone. And that's just an unfortunate you know, mm -hmm. concurrence of events in 2003 when people didn't know very much yet. Right. So I think that's what it was. And, and you know, I think for that reason, um, that's why a lot of the themes in my book revolve around what it means to be lost. You know, they revolve around what is it to navigate your own life, your own way, because I've always felt that part of why my dad died was because someone was lost. Yeah and needing it to be fixed, not wanting mm -hmm. to figure it out on their own. And there have been so many things with his bucket list that I've had to figure out. Because really, I mean, when I went to the, we didn't really have an official trial for her because she was a minor. Mm -hmm. We just had like one day in court where they said they were gonna fine her a certain amount of money. Um, but I remember thinking like that that could have been me. I've used my phone while, I mean, I don't anymore of course, but back then I did because mm -hmm. I didn't know yet. And she was so close to my age that it was like, it was very difficult for me to vilify her. Yeah. Well, you know, unfortunately accidents happen, you know, and it's possible that even if she wasn't using her phone and she was lost, she could have been looking at everything else and still gone through the red light, you know? Um, um, so, yeah, that's true. But what yeah. we teach in, in activism is that, uh, really only like 5% of car crashes are true accidents, meaning, okay. meaning Most like, you know, a, an act of God or, you know, a tree falls on your car or you, you couldn't have anything to do with it. But, but if you do make a choice that is, um, you know, that, you know, that you've been educated about that could potentially endanger you or other people, we just call them car crashes. Yeah. So like, I'll never, you'll never that. hear me call it my dad's crash an accident. Okay. I understand that. I yeah, thank that you for, correct, for that correction because sure. yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and um, start telling us how you got started with the bucket list and what was the first thing that you did? Um, the first thing that I did was uh, run 10 miles straight. Technically. Okay. I mean, I, it's kind of tied. I did run 10 miles straight and then I also did um visit LA. And then I also did uh, have my picture in a national magazine. I did all three of them at first. They all sort of happened together. And, you know, when I found the list and decided, okay, I'm, I'm really going to do this. Um, I started to blog about it 
And I had already convinced my editor at Good Housekeeping to run a story about distracted driving. And then she saw what I was writing about finding this bucket list. And she said, well, we want something personal in the story. And then her editor decided, well, this should be the whole story. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll make the sidebar be the safety information. So I, sh I was shocked by that just because I was a copy editor. You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. there as a writer. And now I have this three page feature um, in a national magazine. So that was how his picture got into a magazine, which I'm sure was not how he ever thought <laughs> that was going yeah, to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah. it was kind of this, um, you know, there was this real concurrence of events where I started training for the LA Marathon which by the time we found the list, I was already signed up for um, oh, just wow. because I wanted, I had already done the New York marathon. I had recently become a long distance runner and I thought, well, I'll just do LA too. And um, I wanted to do something to help young girls because I was getting so much benefit out of running. Um, it just was raising my self-esteem. It was making more, me more confident. So um, I was gonna raise money for girls on the run and then we found the list and I saw the list item that said run 10 miles straight. And I assumed he meant without walking at all. Cause, and I yeah. had never done that cause I had done a marathon, but there's a lot of walking that I did. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll just run the first 10 straight. And then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll kind of like walk some of the remaining 16. And then my friend who lives in LA said that was nuts. And you know, she would be happy to run it with me because we found out you could do it relay style. So then okay. she also raised money for girls on the run. Um, and it was just, it was this beautiful experience because I think our doing that uh, ended up just by accident um, inspiring her daughter, you know, who loved to run, who was four years old. And my niece who then joined Girls on the Run herself and she was nine years old. Um, and she even requested my bib number because she wanted to be like Aunt Laura. Um, and to do it in LA, which was also a list item, you know, on my first day getting there and I got my bib, I also saw that issue of good housekeeping on the newsstand with my dad's picture in it. So it was it was a great entry into this project, yeah. <laughs> I'll put it that way, because my best friend here is helping me. And the list item I'm doing is not just a self-centered act, but rather it's touching somebody else's life who's also learning from the experience. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. I love when all these little synchronicities come together and happen to reinforce that, yes, this is the, exactly the path that I'm supposed to be on. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, well, and you know, w when we were talking earlier about car crashes, you know, I didn't say it to correct you. I said it because one of the things I struggled with after my dad died was the, the notion that it was an accident. Mm -hmm. You know, just the notion that this had happened uh, for no reason. Um, and he just was unlucky because I felt the same way when I learned about my parents' divorce, you know, mm -hmm. like, like I didn't know about this for 12 years, you know, and yeah. I understand why I didn't know. And I appreciate that they protected us from information they thought that was too adult, but it just seemed to me that lots of unhappy accidents <laughs> were happening in my life and it made me feel very out of control. Mm -hmm. And here my dad was this very meaningful person and, this person who cared about intention, apparently, which I didn't even know about. So I think when I learned about what activists call car crashes and the reason for that, it helped me a lot because it helped me to feel like, oh, I can take some agency in this. And mm -hmm. when people drive, they also can take agency if they choose to. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. I wasn't offended or anything. Okay, <laughs> <No>. good. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, so um, how did your mom react to you getting into this bucket list and everything? She was very wary of it. Yeah. yeah. Cause it was, I mean, she was there when he wrote it, <laughs> you know, and, and we, we all knew my dad as this big dreamer. Um, and I wasn't like that as, as far as we knew, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and a lot of some, you know, a lot of the reasons I'm alive, <laughs> and a lot of the wonderful things that have happened in my life have been because of my mom protecting me and how much she had to do to raise us. And she was much more involved in certain areas than my dad was obviously. Um, so I was always going to be much more inclined to listen to what she thought I should do. And so I became nervous as well. Like, what is wrong with me? Why am I doing this? And, you know, I was 38. I was newlywed. 
it made sense that I should be hurrying up to have kids, um, that I should be caring about putting savings into a house that, you know, these were things according to the adult adults, adult rights of passage, I should want, and I'm mm -hmm. supposed to be doing and that she thought I would be doing and I thought I would be doing it wasn't just her. And then I was having this, meanwhile, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, existential crisis, because I'm like, mm -hmm. why don't I care about those things? <laughs> you know, is there something wrong with am I broken? Is there something wrong with me? Because I should because she does and, and my stepdad does and every adult I know cares about that stuff. Except my husband, for some reason, did not care about those things. Um, so it really was difficult. I went through a period of wanting to just be more like that and thinking if only I were more like that, everything would be okay. And so when the list appeared and I had this thing I could do to bring awareness to how my dad died, to also honor him and, and maybe even reconnect with him. Um, I didn't know at that time, but I also was needing to find out who I really was. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened was my mom, even though she's more conservative than me, once she figured that out, that, that she could see it happening in me, then her stance on it shifted completely. And it only took maybe two months, honestly. That's pretty good, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, my mom's also a very emotionally intelligent person. <laughs> so, you know, of course, she's my mom. She, so she wants to protect me from disappointment. But she could see um, the good it was doing for me. And, and that even, you know, long-term problems with my lack of confidence were suddenly being resolved very quickly. And she's, she's told me she could see I could do it. I was doing it responsibly. So uh, she really just became one of my biggest supporters very early. Beautiful. Well, you know, because yeah. one of the things that comes to mind is, you know, a lot of people um, spend their lives creating something because they see what everybody else is doing mm -hmm. and not doing what they really want because they never get in touch with that. So to me, it's amazing that you had the ability to say, let me just look at this in a different way. Let me, let me go ahead and do it and just try it. Um, because a lot of people wouldn't have done that because they are so pigeonholed into at this age, you're doing this at this age, yeah. you're doing that. And so it's, it's, it's very commendable. Um, so I'm sure you, uh, you know that about yourself, but make sure you're patting yourself on the back a lot more often to just be the, the catalyst that other people see that it's okay to, to do your dreams. And it may not be a bucket list of somebody, but your dream is your dream and that it's okay, even if other people see it differently. That's so beautiful. Um, you know, you're moving me to tears because that's what I needed. I needed somebody to come do that for me. Yeah. I've had times in my life that I needed somebody to do that for me too. So I appreciate you, um, you doing that for all of us. Isn't that that's such a beautiful thing when people can find their niche and find a sense of purpose. And it, I think so often that's what it ends up being the thing that they needed to guide them to find themselves. They become that for other people. Yeah. 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 So I appreciate you in, intensely. I really do. Thank you. Um, and I will say, you know, you are a damn good writer. I mean, you <laughs> Thank know, you. because I've read some people's books that, you know, <laughs> they, they write and they're good at writing, but it's like, that was, I mean, you told the story so compellingly and like, it was one of those where you could feel you're in there. You're not just reading the book. And so I know you um, worked at a magazine, but did you have some, um, actual training in writing, or was that just something that came naturally to you? Well, I have a degree in journalism, okay. so I knew how to write articles. And then somewhere along the way, I don't know whether that was reading literary journals a lot or just memoirs. Um, yeah, I became enamored with the essay format. Mm -hmm. And I just really started loving how essays can be very layered. Uh, you could be saying multiple things in one essay. And sometimes it takes further examination to really see what everything the author is using symbols to represent. And then I, I think a big part of it, quite honestly, is I became a TV recapper. <laughs> and yeah. I started deconstructing TV shows like, and this is just on a blog, you know, that anybody, if they wanted to read it, they could. 
Um, I did it for when I worked for OK Magazine and then again when I worked for Good Housekeeping and it was for shows like Lost or Mad Men. Um, I did a little bit True Detective. It was, you know, the thing that all the shows had in common was they were very um, complex. Mm -hmm. And they were the kinds of shows where, I mean, I think they call it smart TV. Like you'd go back and watch it a second time and pick up on little Easter eggs here and there. Yeah. And I'm so detail oriented naturally that it was like a natural fit for me to go through and write down everything I was seeing and then just go and in, in, the, in a rabbit hole and research all of the stuff. And then I would turn it into a recap and that would help people have almost like a Cliff's Notes to the episode. But I think what started happening as I was doing that for I think almost five years, I started learning from those TV writers. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, this is how you sprinkle this here and this here and this here, and it means something, but you don't tell them what it means. <laughs> like, they'll get it subconsciously. And if they're really interested, maybe they'll look into it. So I think that started affecting my writing style. So it got to a point where it was becoming really fun for me mm -hmm. to write a story and have it be layered um, and have it, you know, and, 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 and the, the weird part is, you know, I point out omens in nature and things like that in the book and moments where I think my dad is talking to me. Mm -hmm. And those weren't just me putting that in just to spice up the story. Like those were things that really happened because I actually started experiencing the list as though I was on a TV show, <laughs> like oh, as wow. though I was the character seeing the symbol that, you know, on the show, the character doesn't really see it, the, the viewer sees it, mm -hmm. but that's how I started experiencing my life. So like I was now sort of living in a story. And I think it freed me up a lot um, to accept disappointments with the list, to not take things as personally as I used to. Like, let's say someone was going to do a list item and then they backed out at the last minute. I could say, okay, well, wasn't for them. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, like they weren't aligned with this. And as I began seeing my life as a story, I started to realize, oh, when the bad stuff happens, that's okay too. You know, and yeah. I think you mentioned that at the beginning of this episode, how everything in your life is there to teach you. And later you learn, oh, that thing that was so painful actually gave me a detour and helped me to become the thing I had an intention to be. And without the painful obstacle, like the obstacle is the way, you know, if, without, without mm -hmm. the painful obstacle, I wouldn't get there. So yeah. it helped me to really, you know, because as someone who was very sensitive and I used to, I think someone told me once I had, like a doctor said I had uh, rejection related depression, that that mm -hmm. was when I would have an episode if I felt rejected by something or somebody. So now I would flip it and be like, well, this is okay because it's a story. And it could have like just a bit of detachment. So yeah, and I think getting into my writer mode helped me to do that even more because now I'm starting to piece together even some pretty traumatic experiences in my life and, and I'm seeing how they connect like a puzzle into some of the happier moments and how necessary, like in, in many ways, they were almost more necessary mm -hmm. into shaping me into the person I was becoming. Yeah, definitely. It's like, because for me, it's like I've got tons of stories and the thing that I've learned from each one of them, not right away, of course, but later on, when you look back or when I look back, I can say, oh, if I hadn't learned that thing, if I hadn't had that experience happen to me, I wouldn't have been strong enough to be able to do this here as I'm going to do something else. And, you know, a lot of times it's like we we sit back and this may not be you, but some people that are watching or listening, it may be it was for me. I would just want to be able to magically twitch my nose like bewitched and be where I wanted to be. I didn't want to do all the things to get there. And then when you really get into it, you realize that it's the getting there that's the best part. And a lot of times we kind of want to skirt around all those things. But the delicious joy that we can actually gain from having learned the lesson and share that with someone else and help them have a better life. And, you know, and our lives get better by going through those processes too, you, no matter how um, uncomfortable they may be in the moment, but it's, it's a beautiful thing of how life just plays out. And like you said, doing it as a story 
and being able to see yourself as a character. And I know I've read um, books before that one of the things they'll tell you to do is to write your story as if you're a character. And oh. then and then that way you're it, it's kind of in a way so that you're almost prepaving so you can kind of dream a little bit and put yourself in that future spot and write that as a story like today. Um, and it helps you to, I guess, go from the um, from the eventual thing and make it seem plausible because you're kind of almost writing the story of being there already. And so that's kind of a little bit about what you did, because as you were going through all of this stuff and writing it as a story. Um, and like I said, I, I loved your writing and your writing style. It was very, very compelling to want to, you know, I want to, I want to know what's, what's next, what's next, what's next. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what, that's what it felt like when I was doing it. Yeah. I really, you know, I wanted the reading experience to feel exactly how it felt when I was doing it. Yeah. So did you write it like each thing that you did? Did you write that section or was it something that you had to wait till you'd gotten through it a little bit before you would write that? Um, in the in the very beginning, I was writing each list item that I accomplished as a blog post. OK. And, you know, I had an, an experience early on with a different agent where we tried to pitch it based on those. And that was like those were the writing samples that we had. And it didn't work, I think, mostly because they couldn't figure out, well, what is the what's the arc of this story? You know, what is she going to learn? And also she's brand new at this, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. like someone said, if this feels more like a blog than a book. And yeah, probably because it was mm -hmm. <laughs> at that time. Yeah. And my blog posts were just as detailed and lengthy as my TV recaps. <laughs> it was just <laughs> too much. I had not figured out yet the the brevity that you need for a book chapter. Um, and, it, you know, those are sort of a rough draft, I guess, for what it would end up being. And uh, at the end of the first year, when it turned out that I couldn't sell this as just an idea with, you know, like I said, just the blog post as a sample, um, my agent at the time said, well, I think you need to write 100 pages. And then I lost my job two months later. <laughs> <laughs> which in normal circumstances, you know, I was laid off. It wasn't for cause, but it was like, I would have been devastated. And that would have been the worst thing that ever happened to me. I wouldn't know how I could continue living because that real, that job was my whole life for seven years. And even, even beyond, beyond that, um, other places I worked, it was my whole life. So to now be in a position where, oh, I have a severance and I have free time. Clearly, this was meant to be. I'm mm -hmm. going to sit down and write those 100 pages. So I ended up writing 250 because brevity is not my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just too much. <laughs> and I gave it to the agent. He's like, nope, <laughs> this is too much for us. But I was so like organized about it. You know, like I it was the whole first year of doing the list that I was writing about, even though I was now in year two. Mm -hmm. I gave it to 11 people to read, like beta readers. I joined a writer's group. Um, I had so much feedback and everybody was telling me what was good about it. Um, but they also were saying, I think there's too much here. <laughs> and you I didn't listen. Too much detail? Yeah, too much detail. Okay. Well, I think part of the problem was you don't really know um, your growth as, as the protagonist of a story until you have finished living it. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to step back far enough to understand that that's the story. And I even needed to hire a book proposal editor later on who could teach me that because she's like, she's like, this is about you and your dad. And it's about your growth living out his dreams. And it's also sort of about you and your husband because that's part of your life now. Uh, but anything that does not pertain <laughs> to those relationships needs to be cut back. So, you know, there's going to be less in there of, you know, there's lots of people in my life who I love, who I'm really close to. I couldn't show you the full them because yeah. it was going to be very, very long. Yeah. And, you know, that's the one thing I regret about that, because I, I would like to have a lot more about those people in there. Maybe um, you need and to do a prequel or something. <laughs> I need to do another book that pays tribute yeah. to everybody. That's yeah. what I really yeah. need to do. I know um, for me, if I was writing the book, I would say, oh, my gosh, well, if I don't mention my my cousin in this, yeah. they're going to think I don't love them if I mention this. Yeah. Yeah. So the way that. I did it was just if a person did a list item, I might say a little bit about them. 
but mm-hmm. mostly I'm just talking about them doing the list item. Yeah. So you're not going to know many details about my cousin, my stepbrother, whoever it might be. You'll just know, oh, here's this person who's there doing this. And then a lot of times the list items were helped by strangers too. Mm-hmm. So usually if it were a stranger, I would give a little bit more of a physical appearance because I want you to understand as the reader, I'm meeting them for the first time. Yeah. You know, so I'm studying them and figuring out who they are. We don't do that with people we already know and love. Right. I don't think. <laughs> so um, I don't anyway. So, you know, the thing that was happening in that early draft now, I think in retrospect was I didn't have that growth yet. Um, to understand what the story was. And also, I was afraid. I was afraid of getting into those details of that relationship with my dad. There was so so much that was still healing uh, that I didn't know how to write about because it was still happening. It was still inside of me. So instead, what I gave them was just, you know, uh, tangents into F. Scott Fitzgerald or Jackie Robinson or, you know, just I kept finding these people I found heroic who had done a list item or were were like loosely related to a list item. And it was always someone who like, if my dad were alive, he would love hearing about it. And he would tell me things about them. So almost they were like proxies for my dad that I just Mm -hmm. kept discovering along the way. But that was meaningful to me. It wasn't necessarily meaningful to the reader. So there's still a little bit of that in there because I think my love of history and culture was part of my bond with my dad. So it, it kind of, yeah, because he was an American studies major, you know, he loved our country. So it's, it has to be in there. Sacagawea has to be in there <laughs> to some degree, <laughs> but not all, not all of it, you know? Right. right. So I know you, you're, you still weren't that old when your father died. So you got some time with your father, even though it was kind of hit and miss a little bit. So what, when you look back at the the time that you got to spend with your dad, what is your favorite memory that comes to mind? Oh, it's my first memory. Okay. Like my first ever memory was from Mm -hmm. when I was four years old. And uh, my mom and my dad took me to see my first movie, uh, which was Song of the South. And I know that's not a very, uh, it's not a great movie to talk about these days. (laughs) Uh, It has a lot of problems, but um, there was a song in the movie uh, called Zippity Doodah. And my dad used to love to hold my hand while I would skip and he would sing that song. And, Aww. you know, it's to a point where I'm, I'm really, I've really debated getting a bluebird tattoo on my shoulder because it just so sums up who he was, you know, yeah. just look for, look for the joy, look, look for the, the, the guidance. And, you know, again, that ties into that theme of someone who's lost and how mm-hmm. you don't have to be. Right. Well, that just kind of gives me chills, too, because I can visualize that um, that movie myself, you know, I'm aging myself there, too. Um, but because and and to hear that song in my mind and you skipping along to it, it just I, I don't know. That's just so cool to 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 know. I, I love it. And, you know, the the thing, too, when when you think about that and it makes you happy. That's a wonderful thing to be able to have that experience in your mind with happiness when it, with your dad. And it's funny because one of my favorite memories of my father um, are that he would keep us on Saturdays, my sister and I, and he would, because he, he didn't like to cook or anything. Um, so he would take us to this little fair thing, little carnival, and uh, um, so we could play and get tired, right? And then he would stop by the store, a little convenience store, and he'd give us one of those little Hostess fried apple pies. Oh, I love those. And that was our lunch. But we <laughs> thought he was, daddy was the best because we got the apple pies and, and the Coke for lunch. Mom, once she found out later when we said stuff about it, she was mortified that that's what he fed us for lunch. <laughs> But it's one of my fondest <laughs> memories. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't that seem like that's always the case? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the mother's, the, like I said, my mom kept me alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows if it been left up to my dad, we'd probably always had hostess apple pies. I remember him fixing us tomato soup and grilled cheese too. So that he at least did those two things. 
Yeah. I mean, mo moms are fun too. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, they can be, they can be. Yeah. That's, that's such true. a sweet memory. I mean, and, and I think maybe that is especially true when you have divorced parents and you have mm -hmm. that special time with your dad. Cause it's like, it's almost like he has to concentrate fun, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like let's make sure this time that you have with me is wonderful and is memorable and is fun because, you know, I don't get to put that into every single day anymore for you. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, so we're getting close to time. So is there anything, um, and I know we didn't get into all your bucket list, um, but um, I'm going to have in the description of the um, the podcast, I'll have a link to your book and everything for them. Um, any links that you want to share with them, I will put in there so people can get in touch with you and, and reach out. Um, but is there one thing as since there's a lot we didn't cover, is there one thing in particular that you would like to people know about you, your dad or your book? Um, you know, as I was doing the list, I sort of started developing these new life philosophies mm -hmm. just because the experiences I was I was having were so out there to me. <laughs> they were so different from what I thought I should be doing or would be doing at that age. And I really had to develop new ways of looking at life in order to, to tackle them and, and make them happen. And sometimes I would start to feel like, you know, I think some, there's some divine intervention here. You know, the, the way that happened was a little too easy, you know, or, or something was somebody was in the right place at just the right time who was there to help me, you know, and I was picking up on it a lot more. And one of the strangest things I started noticing was that Anytime I went at a list item with arrogance or thinking I'll do this quickly, you know, or I have it in me, I already know what I need to do, or even like, oh, I don't feel like doing this today. <laughs> you know, whenever I would do it like that, it would fail miserably. Like it just would not work. But whenever I went towards a list item with kindness and generosity and really paying attention to the person who was helping me and listening to them and learning from them, and, you know, in situations where I might be envious of other people's good fortune in my life, instead of treating them differently, pr promoting them and mm -hmm. doing all I could to help them to have more of it. One thing I started learning was um, the idea of abundance. And that really my, my idea that I had my whole life, that there's only so much, you know, to go around. And we have to compete with other people in order to be successful. And if that person has it, then I don't and I can't get it because they took it from me. You know, like I used to look at it like that. Mm -hmm. Now I started seeing it as, oh, wait, like there's more than enough for everyone. <laughs> you know, there's actually like a surplus of opportunity out there and everybody's going to have enough. And actually, when I encourage opportunity and luck and abundance in others, suddenly it starts exploding in my right. life too. And I don't think a lot of people know that. I certainly didn't know that. And I was just sort of by practicality in a position now where I had to think that way. And I remember I had a friend who was a counselor and I was in a particularly low place with the list. And she said, here's what I want you to do. Every single day, I want you to say, thank you God for the abundance. Thank you, God, for the abundance. And she said, and you're going to say that until it's true. <laughs> you know, like you start. Re and, you know, that's the thing you can do at any time in your life, no mm -hmm. matter what you're going through, you know, no matter what uh, is upsetting you. If you're feeling guilt, if you're feeling rejected, if you're feeling hurt, you can do that and you can actually believe it. Because one thing I started learning is that when we make a choice to give to other people, we are replenished. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're sort of like meant to be channels for this good energy. And there's a flow to that. So if you stop isolating and protecting yourself and you stop competing with, you know, how everybody else looks around you, which I think we're getting into a lot these days with social media, if yeah. you stop doing that and instead you're like this towards life and you're like, OK, give me more so I can give it out. It's almost like I looked at it as a horseshoe. Like you're standing underneath of it, you're letting go, you're letting go of everything that's not serving you so that you can give. And then God is going to keep replenishing you because that's, that's what you're, what we're here to do. You know, like if you have a talent, you're supposed to use it to help other people. Like that's why it's there. It's not just right. so you can like look at yourself and admire it. <laughs> 
right. well, I'm so good at violin. Awesome. I yeah. enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. With nobody to listen, that's not very fun. Yeah. You have to share your music. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I love that. And it makes me think, you know, because you said you had your dad was following all these different um, gurus kind of thing, you know, that you were kind of channeling your dad with his um, positivity and his abundance of things that he was researching and looking into. So that's, that's beautiful, beautiful. And I right. mean, it's real. It's not just some wacky ideas somebody had. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I, I, I'm, I'm definitely a proponent of the law of attraction and the vibration. And I look at it as a boomerang. If you're, if whatever you throw out comes back, whether you're throwing out good or you're throwing out bad, it's all going to come back to you in some way. Yeah. Maybe not exactly the way you sent it out, but it's going to come back. I mean, I'm not someone who thinks that it's that way with everything, though. You know, yeah. like some terrible things really do happen. <laughs> yeah, that I didn't necessarily create, you know, but right. but yeah, in general, it's just an easier way to go through life. Definitely. Definitely. All right. So um, what I want to just tell everybody real quick, I want to remind you to make sure that you um, like, subscribe and share and that you leave a comment for Laura if there's something that um, you want to know from her. If there's something you want to know from me, just make sure you leave a comment and we'll get back to you. I promise we will. And then I'll leave you with these final words. The best way to predict the future is create it. So what are you creating? And you be blessed and I'll see you next time. Mwah.